Let us rise. Grace, mercy, and especially God's peace to you from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Dear friends of Christ, the basis for our meditation today is taken from three texts in our readings from 2 Chronicles. The first one is from 2 Chronicles 15. These are all on your bullet, and you'll be able to look at them, and you'll be required to during the message. It says, The Spirit of God came upon Azariah, the son of Obed. He went out to meet Asa and said to him, Listen to me, Asa, and to all Judah and Benjamin. The Lord is with you when you are with him. If you seek him, he will be found by you. But if you forsake him, he will forsake you. The next text is from 2 Chronicles 16, 19, where it says, For the eyes of the Lord range throughout the earth to strengthen those whose hearts are fully committed to him. You have done a foolish thing, and from now on, you will be at war. The last one is from 2 Chronicles 20, where it says, He said, Listen, King Jehoshaphat, and all who live in Judah and Jerusalem, this is what the Lord says to you. Do not be afraid or discouraged because of this vast army, for the battle is not yours, but God's. Here ends the text. You may be seated. There are a couple other readings today that I just love for in the, in the lectionary series that we read every Sunday. They're great readings of 1 Peter 3 with 3.15, always be ready to give reason for the hope that lies within you, but do it with gentleness and respect. And then that text which said Old Testament, but is actually the New Testament readings from the book of Acts that we go through during this period of the church year. Where Paul is at Mars Hill or at the Areopagus. And it's interesting because the, hit that text side ties so well with our society today and with what this, text, what this message is all about. That text, if we'll recall it, I wanted to read it for hearing again. It says, now, <clears throat> excuse me, now while Paul was waiting for them in Athens, his spirit was provoked within him when he saw that the city was full of idols. So he reasoned in the synagogue with the Jews and the devout persons and in the marketplace every day with those who happened to be there. Some of the Epicurean and Stoic philosophers also conversed with him, and some said, What does this babbler wish to say? Others said, He seems to be a preacher of foreign divinities, because he was preaching Jesus and the resurrection. And they took hold of him and brought him to the Areopagus, saying, May we know what this new teaching is that you are presenting, for you bring some strange things to our ears. We wish to know, therefore, what these things mean. Now all the Athenians and the foreigners who lived there would spend their time in nothing except telling or hearing something new. And so Paul, standing in the midst of the Areopagus, said, Men of Athens, I perceive that you are very, that in every way you are very religious. For as I passed along and observed the objects of your worship, I found an altar with this inscription to the unknown God. That text fits so well with our society today. You see, we live in a society that has many gods, and where people are, are they become incensed if you tell them something different. We live in this entitlement mentality where people believe that if they believe it, it's right, and you shouldn't be able to confront them on it. You shouldn't have to. They have the right to believe what they want to believe, and it has inculcated its way even into the church. That's why in this text, when it begins with Paul, it begins with, he saw this going on in Athens, and where did he first go? He went to the synagogue. He went to the people who claimed to be the people of God and started with them, reminding them of what God's message truly was. You see, this entitlement mentality we have sometimes in the church today and sometimes even in, in, in the outer world are the people who want to say that they are Christians, they, they follow Christ, they say, well, God has to love me no matter how I am. After all, God loves everybody, doesn't he? The title of this message is, doesn't God have to love me? And the answer to that is, no, he doesn't. <coughs> There's no reason he has to love you, but God does love you. His love is unconditional. He loves us despite the fact that we are sinners. He loves us before we were even born, he loved us. He loved us from the creation of the world.
world. His love cannot be changed by your circumstances. His love for you as it's, is unconditional really means that. It's without condition. He loves you in spite of yourself. But the question is not whether God loves us. The question is, is our love unconditional for God? That's a whole different question. And one in which our society is really failing at, and we have to be careful in the church of this, as well as in the society outside, because do we love God only if he agrees with me? Do I have a problem with God if he says something and I go, well, no, that's not the way it should be? <laughs> Unfortunately, a lot in the church today, not in our church, of course, but in the church at large, you know, I do want to make it out the door. Um, <laughs> a lot of the world today say, well, God is love. He has to love me just as I am. And, and, and so all my sins... He has to accept. All my failings, he has to accept. And I don't have to work on him at all. I don't have to do a thing because God loves me. You know, God loves us so much, it's beyond our comprehension. God loves us in such a manner that we can't even, we can, we can speak the words, and I love Odin's, Odin's confession of, it's the cross. Jesus died for us. Odin's going to make a great pastor someday. <laughs> That's what you say to confirmands when they're really unruly and it, you scare, scare, scare them to death. He'll be a great pastor someday. <laughs> but the answer is, is, is our love of God has to be unconditional as well. That we love God despite where we are in our lives. That we find ourselves in sin and God says, I don't like that, and we still love God. God says, those actions are, are, are dangerous. We still love God. Trials and tribulations happen in our lives and we still thank God for them. Even the struggles, even the difficulties, we thank God for them. We thank Him in all circumstances. Paul, when he's at Mars Hill, the Areopagus, he's provoked in his spirit. He's upset by this, but he doesn't lash out and, and, and try to figure out, to blast these people. He finds a way to reach them that they understand. You see, he knows God, he knows God loves them too. And so when he gets the opportunity to present to him, he doesn't say, you bunch, you bunch of fools, you don't understand anything. He goes, it's obvious you're a very religious people. You even have an altar to the unknown God. Let me tell you about him. You see, in our text today, we talk about God's presence. That's in the first text in 2 Chronicles 15.1. The Spirit of God came upon Azariah. He went out to meet Asa and said to him, Listen to me, Asa and all of Judah and Benjamin. And I want you to underline this portion in your, in your text. The Lord is with you when you are with him. If you seek him, he will be found by you. God's love is unconditional. He loves us beyond matter, all matter, but he is with us when we seek him. We think of the story of the prodigal son where the son goes off and wastes his inheritance in, in riotous living, as the scriptures say. His father doesn't go with him. His father waits for him. He watches for him. His love for his son is still so great that he waits expectantly for him. But he doesn't go with him. God loves you beyond all measure. But he won't walk with you into sin. The second part of that text, you have to underline too, if you forsake him, he will forsake you. If we walk away from God, he will strive to get us back. 
He will strive to call us home. But if we abandon Him, He will let us go. That's the saddest part. God doesn't abandon anybody, but they walk away from Him. To me, the saddest story in all the scriptures, there are two. There are two, they're both in the New Testament. The one is a rich young ruler who comes to Jesus and said, I would follow you, and, the, and I've followed all the commandments since I was a child, and Jesus looked at him and loved him, and he says, and one other thing, go and sell all you have and give it to the poor and follow me. And the rich young ruler walks away from God sad because he couldn't do that. The other story was our reading from a, a week or two ago, the Emmaus disciples. Who the day of the resurrection are walking away from Jerusalem. And when Jesus walks with them, he talks with them and they say, don't you understand, we heard, we followed this man and we heard that he raised from the dead. And yet they're walking away. Jesus risen from the dead. You were a follower. You hear he has risen from the dead. Wouldn't you stay and see? Wouldn't you stay a day? And instead we find them walking away. We forsake God when we know what he says to do and we walk away from it. We forsake God when we know what he would have us to do in our lives and we ignore That's hard stuff. That's long. We know of God's prom presence. Now we talk of God's promise. And that's in the second one, in 2 Chronicles 16. And it says, The eyes of the Lord range throughout the earth, and you underline to strengthen those whose hearts are fully committed to Him. You see, we may wonder, we don't have the strength to endure, but we don't have to. God strengthens our hearts. We have to commit ourselves to him, and he will grant the strength to accomplish it. You are right. You cannot accomplish it on your own. But with God, there's nothing we can fail to accomplish. You see, when we commit our ways to God and we say, God, I need your help in this, he says, I've been waiting for you to ask. I've been waiting for you to commit your way. The third one is often what we forget, that this is God's world and the battle is his. In the New Testament, Paul writes, we, we contend with princes and principalities that we do not see. But here it says, do not be afraid or discouraged because of this vast army, whatever you're facing, because the battle is not yours but God's. You see, when we look at ourselves and we say, I can't do it, I'm going to give up, we've forgotten who's in our corner. We have forgotten who is, who is going out to battle for us. We have forgotten that God loves us and will protect us. He will watch over us. We go back to God's love now and we say God's love is so great, so great that he sent his son. God's love is so great for you that he sent his son. Jesus' love is so great that he went to the cross for us. Although we don't deserve it, although we are totally sinful and, and without, without justification in God's sight by our own merits, Jesus Christ dies upon the cross for our justification. We may be declared right with God. Does God love us? He loves us beyond all imagining. He would send his son, Jesus the second person of the Trinity loves us so much that he would go to the cross for us. He would die for us. He would endure separation and alienation from God for us on a, that we, our sins might be covered. And the Holy Spirit loves us so much that he dwells in us. We have a spark of the divine within us. First of all, we are made in the image of God, but secondly... We are promised that God has poured his spirit into us. You see, God loves us beyond all measure, beyond anything we could imagine. 
He loves us so much that he doesn't want to leave us in our sinfulness. He loves us so much that he wants better for us. But he loves us so much that he will let us make our choices. Perhaps you have a child and that child has made choices at times which you didn't agree with. They've walked away and they, they, haven't, they, haven't, they haven't honored the, the decisions that you would have them to honor. Sometimes you lose track of them you don't even know where they're at. Your love is still there for them. Your heart breaks because they, are walk, they have walked away. That's how God's love for us works. His love for us never disappears. It's unconditional. He loves us beyond all imagining. But he loves us, he loves us so much that he won't allow us to stay in our sinfulness. So he takes it upon himself. He gives us, he gives us his robe. His ring, His righteousness. And then He asks us where we will go with it. In 2 Chronicles 19, JJ, guess who JJ is? Jumping Jehoshaphat. There is no record that Jehoshaphat ever jumped at all, just so you know. <laughs> but I had to put it there just for the fun of it. But in 2 Chronicles 19, Jehoshaphat asks this question of the Israelites. You see, the Israelites have, have taken upon themselves the foreign gods. They have decided that they are going to serve who they desire to serve and do what they want to do despite what God would say. And I love this question because it says, should you help the wicked and love those who hate the Lord? It's a condemnation question for Jehoshaphat because not that we shouldn't help those who are in need, not that we shouldn't love everyone, but he says, should you help them and love those who hate the Lord more than you love God and serve him? Should you give up your relationship with God to cower or to kowtow to those who are apart from him? This is a struggle we face in our society today. This is a struggle that Paul faced in Athens. How do I proclaim God's word faithfully in a generation that doesn't want to hear or won't believe? The answer is only if we remember that last Chronicles, one that's on your page, that the battle is not yours, the battle is God's. He is the power by which we work. He is the focus of all of our strength. And so when we come to the end of this, normally I'm supposed to end on gospel, and I will, I'll try. The good news, God loves us, forgives us, all that. But the question is, how about you? Are we striving to please someone? Are we striving to serve someone who is drawing us away from our relationship with God? Are they asking us to compromise something that God doesn't love? Are they asking us to put a question mark, as one thing says, where God puts a period? You see, we serve a living God who loves us. We serve a God who calls us into a relationship, who blesses us through that relationship. And if we find someone who says, no, you have to give up what you believe to be with me, that's a choice from temporal to eternal. And will we settle for the temporal when God has given us eternity? Will we deny that which God calls us to do to serve that which the world says is correct? And again, the good news. God's love is unconditional. He loved us before we knew him, before we were born. His love is so great that Jesus Christ went to the cross for the sins of the whole world, but for the sins of the whole world can wash beyond us. We can think, well, not for me, but no, Jesus died on the cross for you. If you were the only sinner in the world, Jesus would have still come and died for you. That's how much his love is for you. 
As we remember those who have fallen in the armed forces in service to our nation this Memorial Day weekend, they didn't die for Joe down the street. They, did, they didn't die for, for one individual. They died for the nation. They didn't pick, well, I'll die for you, but not for you. They said, I will serve our nation. Jesus died for the sins of the whole world. Oh, it's individual. Just as our servicemen died for the, in the service of our nation, but also to protect their loved ones, those whom they knew and those whom they did not know. Jesus died for the sins of the whole world, but he died for you and his love for you. The Holy Spirit, that deposit we have received, that spark of the divine, that's that first portion. The Lord is with you when you are with him. If you seek him, he will be found by you, but if you forsake him, he will forsake you. God has poured his spirit into us, but we can, we can shove him out because God is gracious and loving and kind and compassionate. And he says, if you don't want anything to do with me, I will leave. But what I have to offer you is better. If you don't want to be held by God like a child that won't be held, he will put you down. Not because he wants to, but because he honors your wishes. So it comes down to where does our desire lie? Does our desire to be with God and follow Him or to be with the world? I think your presence here today indicates your desire to be with God. May we follow Him each day and may we rejoice in His gift of salvation to us and may we share it with others. Amen. Let us rise.